Hi everyone, my name is Xin Yao Yi. Uh, the topic of my talk today is CUDA Microbench, Microbenchmarks to Assist CUDA Performance Programming. Uh, this work has been done together with my colleague David Stokes, and this this work is guided by my advisor, Professor Yong Hong Yan from UNCC, and Dr. Chung Hai Liao from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, my talk can be divided into three parts. First, I will introduce the background and motivation. Then I will reintroduce all the micro benchmarks and the performance problems and solutions. Shown, uh, uh, shown by these micro benchmarks from three aspects. Finally, I will reintroduce the summary and the future work. This picture is not unfamiliar to people who have learned CUDA programming. It can reflect the NVIDIA CUDA Manicore architecture and discrete memory system of a GPU accelerated computer system. GPU Manicore architecture implements a thread execution model known as the Single Instruction Multiple Thread, which is SIMT. The GPU executes the same instructions in lockstep across multiple threads that process different data. The NVIDIA CUDA threading model allows for a large number of threads, and threads are organized in a two-level hierarchy named grid and block. GPU schedules swaps of threads onto its many core, typically 32 threads in each warp, and the warp is the scheduling unit of kernel execution. A GPU accelerated computer system can be considered to have two memory systems. The first one is the internal memory hierarchy of the GPU itself, and the second one is the discrete memory system that both CPUs, GPUs, and other devices on the system leverage. As shown in the picture, uh, GPU memory is more complex than CPU memory hierarchy. Different memory has different capacity and speed. There are significant trade-offs depending on the type of memory used. Based on the medical architecture and the complexity of GPU uh, heterogeneous memory architecture, three guidelines for developing high-performance CUDA programs are important. First, GPU kernels should be optimized to saturate as much as possible the massive parallel compatibility of GPUs. Second, deep memory hierarchy inside GPU should be effectively leveraged to maximize the computing efficiency of GPU for kernel execution. Third, memory management and data movement between CPU and GPU memory should be properly arranged to reduce the performance impact of data movement operations. The micro benchmarks are small and representative examples. We believe using micro benchmarks to demonstrate the challenges and techniques is an effective method to help programmers, especially for beginners. As shown in this table, we developed and collected 14 micro benchmarks referred to CUDA micro bench according to the three mentioned guidelines. This table shows the names of the micro benchmarks, the pattern of the performance inefficiency, the optimization techniques we used, speed up in our experiments, and programmability. Programmability is used to indicate the difficulty of programming for a given optimization in our opinion. On a scale from 1 to 5, is 5 being most difficult? Next, I will introduce them one by one. Uh, for the first objective of optimizing GPU kernels to sat saturate the parallel compatibility of GPUs, we include four techniques for CUDA performance optimization. For each technique, it will solve one programming problem. The first one is a programming problem named warp divergence, which means the threads in the same warp enter different branches when they encounter the control flow statement. A warp is the scheduling unit of GPU kernel execution. Because of the lockstep SIMT execution model of GPU, when two threads in a warp execute two separate branches during execution, there could be significant performance penalty. 
for the first kernel, different operations are performed according to the priority uh, of the thread ID. In this case, all warp threads execute both branches through only the relevant threads commit, commit the results. Obvious, there is a performance loss here. The second kernel shows how to optimize the first one to remove warp divergence. It ensures that all threads in a warp execute the same branch. The performance results are shown in this figure. We can clearly see that the performance difference between the two. The computation ability of NVIDIA Tesla V100 we used is pretty good. So when the amount of data is not that big, the difference is not obvious. But for GPUs with not particularly particularly good computation ability, and especially when they need to do a large amount of calculation, the performance imp improvement caused by avoiding warp divergence may be very obvious. Uh, we also use NVProof to show the execution efficiency of the word of the two kernels. They are 85% and 100% for the first and the second kernel respectively. The second one is a technique named dynamic parallelism. It allows the GPU to generate its own work by launching other kernels instead of requiring the kernel jobs to be submitted by the CPU. For any given threads in a block, it can launch its own child block. Workloads that requires the use of nested parallelism, such as those using adaptive grids, particularly benefit from this feature. The pseudocode is a portion of Mariana Silver algorithm, which recursively subdivides the calculations for the metal broad set. The blue code shown shows how a thread in a kernel causes other kernels. The results show significant improvement of about 3.26 times when using dynamic parallelism over disabling. Uh, it for rendering a 16,000 times 16,000 image. And uh, our experiment shows that the larger the picture is, the bigger the improvement will be. From Fermi architecture, NVIDIA GPUs introduced a feature called concurrent kernels, which enable CPU to launch multiple kernel instances on, a, on the GPU. This feature helps performance improvement for those kernels that are memory bounds because such algorithms usually do not exhibit sufficient parallelism and allowing executing multiple kernels concurrently would increase utilization of GPU cores. To demonstrate this feature, we select the example from CUDA samples as our micro benchmark. In this program, there are multiple uh, uh, asynchronous uh, kernels that are to be launched by a loop and each kernel is associated with the CUDA stream. As shown in the, in the picture, the concurrent execution of those kernels can be visualized using uh, NVIDIA NVVP thread management tool, and the blue part show the activities of the kernels. When we use eight CPU threads to launch concurrent kernels, uh, the version that uses concurrent kernel execution is uh, approximately seven times faster than the version that uses serial kernel launching. The task graph feature was introduced in CUDA Include a code example from CUDA samples to help illustrate the use of this feature. This allows for a more effective and flexible model for submitting work to the GPU. The task graph can consist of a series of operations such as memory copy and kernel setup, startup. It provides a mechanism to launch multiple GPU operations through a single CPU operation to reduce overheads. In some specific applications which has many repeatable tasks, task graph might improve the application's efficiency and performance. Now I will introduce the micro benchmarks for performance optimization according to the second guideline, which is to effectively leverage the deep memory hierarchy inside the GPU. 
The first one is using shared memory to improve the performance. Shared memory is a high-speed programmable SRAM on this GPU chip, and all threads in the same block can access it. The latency of the shared memory is almost the same as that of the register, and its capacity is several times that of the registers. A known example of using shared memory is matrix multiplication, which has a very high data reuse rate. In the implementation, the algorithm divides the large matrix into 16 times 16 tiles, copies each tile into the shared memory for calculation, and then performs the accumulation operation at last to get the result. For a matrix with a size of 2048 times 2048, compared to the version that only uses global memory, using shared memory can increase performance by 20% and scales well with matrix size on most NVIDIA GPUs. On the GPU, data transfer between global memory and on-chip storage are by chunk for each memory transaction. Even only a small subset of a chunk is requested by a thread. Memory coalescing is a technique in GPU programming to use minimal transactions to fulfill the memory requests by a large number of threads. If each thread accesses 128 bytes of data that is the size of a chunk of a memory transaction, figure A show, uh, shows that each thread accesses the consecutive bytes of 128 bytes. Thus, the memory requests by all eight uh, threads can be fulfilled by one memory transaction. Figure B shows the situation in which the eight threads access the bytes with 128 bytes thread. Eight memory transactions are needed to transfer all bytes to fulfill only 128 bytes data requested by the threads. Figure C shows random access situation that causes uncoalesced memory access. Eight adjacent threads need to access uh, memory with unevenly distributed threads. Five memory transactions are needed to transfer the data needed by the threads in this case. For this situation, uh, we include sparse matrix multiplication, including microbench, which can be found in our GitHub repository. Here, we just introduce A and B to show the problem. Uh, when writing CUDA programs, the approach of how the iteration of a data parallel loop is distributed to the threads impacts the memory access pattern of CUDA threads. Thus, could result in coalesced or uncoalesced memory access. There are two approaches that are commonly used for loop distribution, block and cyclic distributions. The kernel in the yellow region uh, shows the AXPY application, which calculates yi equals to yi plus a times xi. As shown in the kernel in orange region, a block distribution splits the iterations into chunks of continuously uh, iterations among all threads, one thread per chunk. It will end up as uncoalesced memory access by the thread to the array x and y. The kernel in the blue region shows the cyclic distribution, which can fix the uncoalesced memory access. Loop iterations are assigned to uh, threads in cycles starting from the first iteration for one iteration per thread. Threads are recycled for the remaining iterations. By doing this, we allow threads to access consecutive elements of the two arrays and the coalesced access is achieved. The experimental results in the figure show that using cyclic distribution is about 18 times faster than using block distribution. As mentioned before, the GPU memory collector transfers memory in chunks for each memory transaction. Alien memory access means that the first memory address uh, accessed is exact multiple of a memory chunk. Alien and misalien memory access can be demonstrated by modifying the AXPY uh, example shown here. Um, 
the results show that the alien access has a clear though small performance improvement because of smaller number of memory transactions are performed in the alien memory access. The reason for the mi minor performance difference of the two memory accesses is that the GPU we used is Tesla V100, which has L1 cache, making the effect of misaliened on through, uh, throughput for sequential memory access across threads small. However, for some GPUs without L1 cache, the performance loss caused by misaliening access could be much larger. For example, for NVIDIA GPU with computing power of 1.0, which only has an L2 cache, any unalien access transited by the half thread will result in 16 separate 32 byte transactions. Next, I will introduce the overlapping and pipelining data copy between global memory and shared memory using mem copy async function. As we know, before using shared memory, data needs to be copied from slower global memory to the faster shared memory. To accelerate this copy, recent CUDA introduces a synchronous uh, memory copy, the mem copy async function. This feature is realized based on two aspects in NVIDIA's new Ampere architecture. First, the hardware acceleration that bypassing register access. Second, pipeline the memory copy operation to overlap computation and memory operations. This performance improvement is demonstrated in AXPY and the asynchronous kernel is 1.04 times faster. This can be expected to increase as the amount of reads and writes to the shared memory increases, allowing for further scaling. Next, I will introduce Shuffle. Kepler and the new generation GPUs introduce a new warp level intrinsic called the Shuffle operation. This feature allows threads in the same warp to exchange data directly between registers by passing the local memory. Before that, the data exchange between threads must go through shared memory. We include a reduction micro benchmark to show the advantages of using Shuffle. Compared with the traditional version by using Shuffle, threads in the same warp can directly uh, share part of their results between registers as soon as they are free. The experimental results show that uh, as the size of the input array increase, uh, the advantages of using Shuffle become more obvious. Um, the figure shows that when the problem size reaches 134 million, using Shuffle will increase the execution efficiency by about 25%. Bank conflict is a common problem which could significantly impact uh, GPU kernel performance. GPU shared memory is architectured into multiple eco-sized memory models, which we name them banks. As shown in this picture, one column presents one bank. When shared memory is allocated, consecutive data are sequentially mapped to consecutive 32 banks in cyclic distribution, as indicated, as indicated by the black arrows shown here. When different threads in a warp access different locations of the same bank at the same time, access is serialized. Like shown in the picture, thread 0, 1, 2, and 3 access different locations in bank 0. So there, there will have a four-way conflict. We use the classic reduction algorithm as the benchmark to uh, demonstrate the impact of bank conflict on performance. The first one is for the uh, non-continuous reduction. The logic can be shown in this figure. Uh, the size of the stride of each iteration is multiplied by two, which causes a two-way bank conflict. The, in the second iteration, uh, it has a stride of four, which causes a four-way bank conflict. When the stride size reaches 32, all threads access bank zero and the accesses are ser serialized, causing lowest memory access efficiency. But 
when we change this part in the red, red rectangle to this. The second function is for continuously reduction. The logic can be shown in this figure. We can think about that the first half and the second half of a matrix are added element by element. The length of the matrix matrix is reduced by half for each iteration. This method has a one-to-one -one mapping between the thread and the data item, causing no bank conflict. The performance of the uh, thread and the data item Sorry, the performance of the two kernels are shown in this figure, and the array size increases. Uh, the algorithm's advantages without bank conflict become more and more apparent. Now I will introduce the micro benchmarks for performance optimization according to the third guideline, which is to properly arrange in data movement between CPU and GPU. Using CUDA stream and CUDA micro memcop a sync function to move data between CPU and GPUs enables parallelism and overlapping between data movement and kernel computation. The benefit of it of this approach uh, varies depends on both the computation kernels and the quantity of data movement, as shown in figure. Uh, for the modified XPY. Using asynchronous copy operations provides a small improvement to performance. Considering XPY has one-to-one -one ratio between data movement and the computation, data movement is the do dominating factor for the performance. Thus, even with overlapping, its benefits is minimal. For computation that are likely uh, computation intensive, the benefit would be more obvious. NVIDIA GPUs has, have reserved part of the DRAM as read-only memory, known as constant memory and texture memory. The micro benchmark we developed to evaluate the use of two uh, kinds of read-only memory is matrix addition, which allows for evaluating the effect of two-dimensional texture memory. The results on the NVIDIA Tesla K80 are shown in the left figure, this one. When using texture memory instead of global memory on two matrix, matrices of size uh, 20,480 times 20,480, we saw a significant performance gap with up four times the speed. Now let's go to the third topic the impact of memory access density to performance. Memory access density refers to the ratio of sizes of the data used for calculation and of the data transferred between CPU and GPU. Ideally, we would like all data transferred are useful for computation, meaning high memory access density. One of the optimized solutions is to use unified memory such that data are copied from CPU memory to GPU memory when they are needed and accessed. The test. GPU unified memory transfers only the necessary pages which contain the necessary data between CPU and the GPU during execution. Our benchmark to evaluate the density impact is to use a stride to control density for AXPY. The larger of the stride, the lower the access density. The performance results shown in the second figure confirms that when the density is low, which means the stride is high, using unified memory significantly improves the performance. Um, a simple and classic example of unnecessary data transfer is sparse matrix processing. For a known sparse matrix, compressed storage format can be used to reduce the amount of data to be transferred and the amount of computation. We use the example of sparse matrix factor multiplication to illustrate this problem. The input matrix is sparse and it can be stored in CSR format. When using the traditional rule for the storage format and save all elements of the sparse matrix, we need to transfer the entire n times n elements in the matrix to, to the GPU, shown here. When using CSR mode to store the matrix, we only need to copy three one-dimensional vectors for the CPU, which is n plus 1 plus nz plus nz. nz means the number of the non-zero elements. 
The, res uh, the results shown in the right figure shows that as the number of non-zero elements decreases, the, ma the metrics become more sparse and the advantages of using CSR format become more obvious. Uh, for the conclusion of, work, of our work, first we developed a micro benchmark suite for assisting users to optimize SCUDA programs for NVIDIA CPUs. Second, each benchmark has kernels for demonstrating performance problems and reference solutions and optimization techniques to address the problem. Third, the micro benchmark can be used to evaluate the performance of CUDA code with different GPU architectures for validating and comparing software tools for their performance analysis compatibility, uh, helping users understand the complexity of heterogeneous GPU systems and guiding users to optimize performance. For the future work, first, we will update and upgrade the benchmark to evaluate new features available in the latest CUDA programming mode model. Second, more benchmarks and programming optimization techniques will be added as we improve the study. Third, we will use these micro benchmarks with performance tools and compiler analysis for the purpose of evaluating tools capability of detecting memory problems. Fourth, we will develop smaller, uh, similar set of benchmarks using OpenCL to evaluate GPUs from other vendors. Uh, that is all for my talk today. Thank you so much for your listening. Also, thanks to the sponsors and the reviewers. Um, I am glad to answer any of your questions. And uh, I would like to invite my colleague David Stokes to answer the questions together. Wonderful. Thank you for your talk. Um, Thank you. So uh, I have a question related to the programmability. You said it's mm -hmm. from one to five. I wonder how did you determine the actual number? Is there some kind of criterion catalog or a template that you used? So we had looked a little bit into developing a more kind of measured systematic approach for defining the pro programmability. Um, okay. But the kind of issue ended up being that particularly with these this kind of really wide range of topics um it becomes really hard to under to know specifically well how hard is the programming it depends on what kind of program you are um so we kind of took it more from the perspective of just qualitatively doing kind of a quick analysis in the sense of hey like you know we have a variety of skill levels on our team like for myself i was relatively new to cuda so i was like hey for me this was like really hard and then you know Zinia was like oh this wasn't that bad um, and so we kind of more trying to calibrate it based on kind of more qualitative data, just because we couldn't come up with a good a kind of good mechanism to quantify it in a way that we were happy with. Mm -hmm. Great. I see. Yeah. So it's it's very subjective, but that's all right. Just good to see. Um, I, yeah, I liked a lot on your talk that you had so many different benchmarks. I was a bit rushed, but surely, you know, the papers are, will be available and they are available in the workshop proceedings. Yeah. So use your time, you know, to download them. I just did it today. Um, so have a look and then I'm sure you can approach the respective um, speakers. So one, one, qu one other question from me is when I see a speed up, such as here, this host device overlap, yeah, which was 1.04. Is mm -hmm. the mem copy async function, right? I yeah. sometimes wonder, you know, or this one, yeah, this is also good. The global shared memory, you know, in your benchmark, I mean, you saw that it is 4% faster, right? But um, mm -hmm. as a user, I mean, I would say, yeah, maybe that's something you can consider. And given that the, from the programmability side, I agree that this post device overlap thing can be implemented probably quickly, but it seems to be more important to focus here on like this mini transfer where you said um, having the proper data layout that is important. And I think, you know, sorting these um, optimization strategies uh, would be very he helpful for newcomers, as you said, um, and people that try to optimize as a guideline, you know, what to look for. Well, what, yeah. what are you? Yeah, and I guess I would say as a 
just I know we're short on time, so I want to make sure we kind of I can get we sort of answer your question. Um, where it ends up being that yeah, we found that we found the value in doing this kind of more broader scoped work was we were able to quick we were able to start to notice the trends of like, hey, like men copy async is not something that's going to provide meaningful performance improvement for most programmers. So it's not worth right. The idea here is that you know for somebody who's more newer to you know CUDA based programming and, and kind of understanding uh, GP GPUs as a whole. Right, they can kind of quickly look and begin to understand where are the bottlenecks in the system, where 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 do you get a lot of improvement, where do you not, um, right? When where do you get 1.04? When do you get 90, 190? Yeah, agreed. I mean, I also look forward to see that for different uh, newer models and older models, of course, for GPUs, of course, the ratio may change. But very nice. So um, thanks.